how is Allah mentioning them? وَالشَّمْسِ وَضُحَاهَا وَالْقَمَرِ إِذَا تَلَاهَا He's swearing by them. He's swearing by them. So Allah's taking an oath. And we know as, as, as Muslims you can't take an oath by anyone other than the Prophet or by my mother's life or something like that. That's not allowed actually. You can only take an oath by Allah. But Allah can take an oath by any uh, anything He likes. And often He He calls to mind certain great aspects of His creation. But nowhere in the, and, and the point of an oath is it emphasizes what's coming after the oath. So if Allah takes an oath and didn't just say something but takes an oath before he says it, then it means that that thing has been given an additional importance. But here we don't have one oath, but how many oaths? Seven or eleven, depending on how you count them and how you, you use the wow. But seven or eleven consecutive oaths, you don't find that anywhere else in the Quran. So we should really read this story and think, what is Allah emphasizing with seven or eleven consecutive oaths? And what is it? So he talks about the soul, and then at the end of the oaths, he says, he succeeds who purifies his soul. That's what it's all about. It's not about establishing an Islamic state or doing whatever else. It's just about purifying the soul primarily, and then everything else will come as a consequence of that. So disciplining the ego. And, and that's something we should remember as doctors. How many conflicts happen just because of, it's a conflict of egos? I don't want to manage the patient that way because that's how he said or she said I should manage it, and I wanted to do it this way, but actually that way might be right, and this way might be wrong. I want to be the person in charge, even though I might not be the most confident for this particular complication. So being humble, and okay, it's easy as medical students to be humble, but as you progress, then you'll find it easier and easier to be arrogant, and it's something we should guard against. Um, and, and not being afraid to ask for help. Again, it's easy as a medical student to ask for help, but as you progress and as you're a senior trainee, you don't be seen as incompetent and you might not know how to do something and you think, well, shall I just see if it works rather than looking like I'm someone who always needs help? No, and it's something you're rated on now with feedback through institute. Are they aware of their own limitations? Are they able to ask for help? And Allah tells us in the Quran, ask the people of remembrance, the people of knowledge, if you do not know. Always ask, always ask. Prophet ﷺ didn't like people to just give a fatwa uh, without without asking. You, and, and in medicine, it's also dangerous. Imam Malik, people came to him, traveled from so far, and he answered most of their questions apart from a few with "I don't know." And he was one of the greatest scholars of his time. Uh, and knowing that, actually, your position, <laughs> Allah says, "In the akramakum and Allah, that nobility is by taqwa. The most noble in the sight of Allah." is, is, is uh, the one who has the most taqwa. So you don't know, you may be the senior consultant chief, uh, you know, medical director or whatever, and but if some humble uh, porter has more taqwa than you, then that person is far greater in the sight of Allah. So just have those as your standards rather than your position. Knowing that the Prophet said, if you had a mustard seed or an atom's weight, however you translate it, of arrogance, you won't be able to enter Jannah. That's a big thing. Just take any arrogance out of your heart. What are the two types of people who won't, won't learn, some of the scholars would say? There are two types of people who will never learn. If you're medical students, you want to learn. What's going to stop you from learning? Two characteristics. One's a bit easy. The arrogance. Arrogance, right? If you're arrogant, you'll never learn. You're just, oh, I know it better than him. What have I got to learn from that person? Actually, you can learn from anyone. And often people who you learn, consultants often learn from their juniors, their juniors have been on other fir firms and know other ways of doing things, and if they're not arrogant, they'll often learn a better technique from their junior, or you might even learn from the scrub nurse in theater, actually, oh, I didn't know we could do it that way, and, and then you learn something, and you feel like you're above someone else. So the arrogant one will learn, and the other category of people is the shy, interestingly. If you're shy, you also won't, won't learn. Islam va va valorizes shyness, it's shyness, modesty is a, is a manifestation of Iman, and it's a characteristic of this religion except in seeking knowledge. In seeking knowledge, you shouldn't be shy. Oh, I don't know how to pray, but I'm a bit shy to ask someone, so I'll just make that myself. I don't really know how to do this operation. I'm a bit shy to ask someone, so I'll, yeah. No, it's the shy and the arrogant won't, won't learn. Surgeons and anesthetists have got coffee. I mean, kind of surgical specialty. You often find this ego uh, conflict, and, and, and the surgeon's doing a very skilled procedure, and thinks the anesthetist is doing nothing, just reading the crossword, puts the patient to sleep, brings the patient back and, and there's often a very kind of, you know, this guy, what's the point of even having him there? But as soon as something goes wrong, as soon as the patient's blood pressure stops dropping or something, then you realize who's actually the most important person there in theatre. It may well be the anaesthetist who's been, you know, relegated to the sides for the whole procedure and suddenly he comes into his own, he or she, and then it's a, the point of this is to always respect everyone has something to offer, 
you may be the best and most skilled in your specialty, but someone else has something that, that you won't have. And just having, not having that arrogance, but having that humility and wisdom to see the good in the other person. That yes, there may be one deficiency or something I'm better at than that person, but there's something else that they're better at than, uh, than me. The Prophet ﷺ said, let not a believing man hate a believing woman. If he sees something bad in her, there'll be something else he likes in her. So there's always something good. And this doesn't just apply to marriages. If you apply it to you know, hospital uh, hierarchies and, 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 and the society as a whole, you, you hate something, but know that there are about 10 other things in, that they're better at than you. Uh, and if you can't think of those things, it's just you don't have the intelligence or the imagination. It's not because you're really better than that person. So just having that way of the always seeing the good in people and, and realizing everyone brings them something to the table. And the final thing is not just seeking authority for its own sake. Again, a lot of why the NHS becomes inefficient is people think, I want to be in charge, I want to be in charge, this is my bit, I don't want you know, my trainees to be taken off to do something else, I want this as my little empire. Seeking authority for its own sake. Sometimes there's a, there's a wisdom, yes, I want this team to be doing this all of the time because that's the most efficient way of doing it. And if it's for that reason, that, that's... Um, Fair enough. But if, if it's because I want to be in charge of my little empire, I don't want anyone else to encroach on it, then that's seeking authority for its own sake. As the Prophet said, these positions of authority are not given to those who seek it. So does that mean you should never seek positions of leadership? Do we have an example in the Quran of, of someone ostensibly seeking leadership? Yeah, Yusuf al Islam. What does Yusuf al Islam say? When he interprets a deep dream, he tells them. That should be in charge of that yeah, family. after interpreting the dreams, and after they, so seven years later, they've forgotten about him, and he interprets the dream of the, yeah, that's right, of the, of the king, the Malik, not the pharaoh, the king. Uh, and uh, he says, so the, uh, the king's very impressed with him, he says, Set me over the storehouse of the land, make me the treasurer, there's a time of famine going to come, make me the treasurer, and I will guard them with full knowledge. In the hafilun ani. So scholars then have a job explaining this because, okay, we're not meant to seek positions of authority. How come Yusuf is asking for a the position of authority? Okay, there's no one more powerful than the treasurer in the time of famine. But because he knows that he's the only one who can deal with it. Some of the uh, scholars of Tafsir say that he was, the house he was in wasn't the captain of the guard, but it was the Aziz of Egypt, and that person was the treasurer, the house in, in which he was a slave. And then he, that's how he learned the ropes of the treasury, and then later he becomes the treasurer. So the evidence of him having the same position as his former master is that he's then later called Ayyuh al-Aziz. He's called the Aziz, so it suggests that he's in the position of his former master, maybe. But for some reason, he knows that he has the confidence to deal with this, and we'll see how he dealt with it later on in Surah Yusuf, as, as, as he dealt with it very well, so that people from Sham and the Levant came to Egypt because it had a surplus in that time of famine. And therefore, he put himself forward. So when you know that you're competent in an area, you're not meant to keep quiet. You're meant to rise to the challenge and, and put yourself forward. Not just, you know, there's a cardiac arrest happening, you're the anesthetic registrar, and, you know, I don't want to seek this position of leadership, but the medical student leader, and I'll, I'll so, you know, so you have to come forward. If you're an ophthalmology registrar, then you're probably better off sitting back and letting the medical student do But not if you, you really are confident. Okay, and, and okay, one of the last points, I think. Evidence based medicine and the doctors. So we hear a lot about evidence-based medicine and how we should all have some tools of critical evaluation and try and have some uh, evidence underpinning our, our management decisions. And I've got a bias, to, I spent half my time doing research now, so I've got a bias towards this and I think research is important. But even doctors who aren't very involved in research should have this.